Excellent. Thanks so much, Greg. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, like Red, Greg said, um, we're going to be talking about changes that are coming to MSA. And specifically, what do these mean for cattle producers? So just looking across to the next screen. Um, firstly, a bit about MLA. So we work in collaboration with the Australian government and the wider red meat industry. We invest in initiatives that contribute to producing profitability, sustainability and global competitiveness. So we work across all red meat sectors, so it includes goats, sheep meat, um, grain fed and grass fed cattle. So a little bit more around what we do. Um, MLA, we're a service provider to industry. So we do research, development um, and adoption and these, these programs there to increase the productivity on farm and across the supply chain um, and ultimately support industry prosperity. We also carry out um, marketing activities to grow both the domestic and international demand for Australian red meat. Uh, this includes globally 100 different markets uh, that we supply red meat into and we play a pretty critical role in sort of supporting exporters and, and increasing market access for our red meat exports. Like I said before, um, we're a service provider to industry. We're, we're not an industry representative body or a lobby group. And as such, we, we're not involved in any lobbying or agri-political events, uh, activities, sorry. Uh, this is more the role of your peak industry councils. So for beef producers, Cattle Council of Australia, Feed Lotters, um, the Australian Lot Feeders Association. I suppose with the peak, just mentioning peak industry councils now, the other role, um, along with consultation from producers and, and the government and other industry organisations, is, is these councils really guide our investments into our research development and adoption and marketing, um, as well as how industry levies are, are being invested at MLA. So the changes coming to MSA. Um, firstly, I'm going to talk and touch on the solid foundations of MSA. So as most of you know, MSA operates across the supply chain uh, from, from farm through to the processing, wholesaler, uh, retail and food service sectors of our industry. Um, but ultimately the program is totally focused on satisfying the consumer and meeting consumer expectations in regards to eating quality. So all inputs into MSA, they're, they're tested by consumers, it's underpinned by science and it's endorsed by industry. I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail soon. We're going to talk specifically about the changes that are coming um, and how these are going to affect cattle producers. Uh, we're rolling out a range of changes from June this year. These changes, they relate to the MSA vendor declaration, uh, the model that sits behind MSA and also the My MSA online platform. And lastly, we're going to talk about the next steps. So when these changes are happening um, and then also producers will be receiving further communication from us over the coming months. So a little bit more detail around our changes. Um, for producers, one of the biggest changes that you'll see uh, is a change to the MSA vendor declaration form. Um, this will include the simplified reporting of tropical breed content and we've added fields to include producers um, who are custom feeding or have cattle on adjustment and I'll talk again in more detail around that. I'm going to talk a lot about the changes that we're making to the model and when I talk about the model, because um, I'm going to use the term model quite a lot throughout this presentation, it's basically just the computer program that sits in the background and holds all of the calculations that sit behind MSA to be able to predict the eating quality scores of the cuts within the carcass. So it also then calculates out for producers your MSA index, uh, which a lot of you will know, it's just that weighted average of 
the eating quality scores of the cuts within the carcass. And it gives that overall um, indication of eating quality of the carcass. So with the model, um, MSA, we're always continually updating our model to include new pathways uh, or adding, add further integrity to our existing pathways in place at the moment. Uh, in particular, what's changing in the coming months is that the MSA model is almost doubling the amount of cut by cook combinations. So increasing from around 169 cut by cook combinations to 275 of those. The reason we're doing this is to include new cooking methods that sort of keep up with that ever increasing um, and popular foodie trends that we're seeing. So including cook methods such as sous vide and combi oven roasting, uh, these are becoming increasingly popular in the larger food service industry. At the moment, we're doing a little bit of work. Uh, well, we're doing work on testing that Texas style barbecue, low, slow uh, cook method. And uh, these, once research is, and the consumer sensory is completed on this, this will be added into our model. We're including new secondary cut uh, and seam cuts, such as the petite tender and the flat iron, which both um, come from the blade. And we've done some work around extending extended aging predictions suitable for export markets. So at the moment, our max predictions for aging is out to 35 days. Um, we're extending that for the suitability of export out to 50 days. So just sort of taking into account the fact that product um, is, will be sitting in transit for, for longer periods of time. And I'm gonna talk in a lot of detail around hump height as a direct predictor of eating quality. So while hump height has always been measured uh, in, as part of the MSA grading, uh, we'll now be using that as the predictor, um, the direct predictor of eating quality. Last thing that we're going to have a quick look at is my MSA. My MSA is getting a little bit of a facelift um, and a refreshed look. We're going to have some enhanced feedback added in. So on feedback sheets, we're introducing an opportunity index and I'll talk more about it in detail. Uh, but going, so my MSA will continue to hold all the benchmarking features uh, and customised reports that producers are using now. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, MSA, we're an eating quality program, totally, satis totally focused on satisfying the consumer. And as such, any input into the program, it's tested by consumers, it's underpinned by strong science, and it's endorsed by the industry. So like I said, MSA, it's underpinned by rigorous research and development. Um, listed on this slide are some examples of research trials that have been conducted over the past few years the results of which are being incorporated into the changes in the model over the next few months. So we're continually updating the model uh, and the calculations that sit behind the predictions to include new pathways, further test those factors that affect eating quality and add integrity to our current existing pathways. So, the changes to the MSA model, they're underpinned by strong science, and this includes our consumer sensory testing. Just in regards to the list, all our final reports are available on the MLA website. So you can go onto our website, there's a search function within our research and development section, and you're able to search for these, for these reports to find out a little bit more around, around the research. It's important to note, um, at this point that any change that we make within MSA, um, within the whole of the program, and this includes our model updates, these are done with industry endorsement. So we don't make any of these changes uh, in isolation. Um, this includes being endorsed by researchers and representatives within the livestock and red meat industries. So we have these committees in place um, in which any change or introduction to our program goes through a 
very rigorous consultation and review prior to the implementation of that change. So just a bit about each of these committees. We have the MSA Pathways R&D Committee. This is made up of independent scientists um, and industry reps. And this also includes sort of the senior scientists behind the research that's being conducted, the statisticians that we work with, and also the founders of the MSA program. And again, lots of different individuals um, from across the country. The MSA Beef Task Force, um, it includes representatives from your peak industry councils. So like I mentioned before, Cattle Council of Australia, uh, the Australian Lot Feeders Association, and also um, the Australian Meat Industry Council. And lastly, we've got the Australian Meat Industry Language and Standards Committee. So this is, this committee looks more at the regulatory side and it's a combination of government representatives and again, representatives from the peak industry councils. So we don't make these changes in isolation. Uh, they're made with strong industry endorsement and they go through a very rigorous consultation and review, review period. Yep. And just sort of just to reiterate, our changes underpinned by strong science, including that consumer sensory testing. And any change that we're really making, it's, it's to strengthen our program while also aligning to the objectives of the peak industry council, so your industry representatives. So jumping into the changes that will be affecting cattle producers. Like I said, we're gonna talk specifically about changes to the MSA vendor declaration, the model change, um, focusing in on, on using hump height as that direct predictor and what's being changed at, in my MSA. So what you'll see in the online platform. So firstly, we're updating the MSA vendor deck and as all, as per all previous versions, we require this vendor declaration to be filled out correctly and to accompany consigned cattle along with your national vendor declaration um, for cattle to be eligible for the MSA program. So the first change that you'll see here is the inclusion of both vendor details and owner details of cattle if these are different. Currently, if your cattle are being custom fed at a feedlot or on adjustment prior to consigning, there's no way to actually receive, as an owner, there's no way to actually receive direct um, feedback back from my MSA um, for those cattle. And what we wanted to do was accommodate those scenarios within this new MSA vendor deck. So what it'll allow is for direct feedback of carcass data to the owner, provided that the vendor completes this section A with your details. So in other words, if you're consigning via a third party, the added owner fields will allow you to receive and, and access the feedback directly via my, my MSA. The next change that we've made is the simplified reporting of males and females. So if you look over to the current version on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that we use the term steers and heifers, and that has been simplified to males and females. Now it's really important to note that the same eligibility applies for steers or males. Um, within the program, we don't accept entire males or males with secondary sexual characteristics. Um, and then for females, we accept all females, so heifers and cows. And lastly, we've simplified the reporting of tropical breed content. So this is a simple yes, no tick box now, rather than um, ticking the highest tropical breed content for the lot. And we'll talk a little bit more um, about this just in a second. The new MSA vendor decks are going to be available in September. Now it's also important to note, um, you don't have to start using them straight away if you have a hard copy MSA vendor book, declaration book at home, you can 
continue to use the current MSA vendor decks um, until those run out and then you'll just have to order your new book or access the um, electronic version via the LPA service centre. So moving on to hump height and using this in our model as a direct predictor for eating quality. So just firstly, within the MSA model, we use 12, we measure 12 different attributes and these are combined to predict the eating quality of the cuts within the carcass. So one of these attributes is hump height and it's simply the measure of the size of the rhomboidus muscle um, in millimetres. And when we measure this during the grading, during grading, uh, it doesn't include any fat coverage across that muscle either. So initially hump height uh, in conjunction with hot standard carcass weight and sex was used to basically confirm or, or verify the declared Bos indicus content. Um, so that tick box that you would have seen in on the current MSA vendor declaration. Now the initial research that was carried out to test that relationship between hump height and Bos indicus content, it utilised uh, groups of, of cattle um, with known genotypes or known pedigrees um, and it used different groups with varying percentages of, tro of tropical breed content. And in the research, which includes our consumer sensory testing, we found that consumers can differentiate between Bos indicus cattle and Bos taurus cattle and also the percentage of Bos indicus as it becomes higher. So moving, fast forwarding a little bit uh, and moving into um, more recent research that's been conducted, um, we, we've done some research around using genetic markers to understand further understand that relationship between Bos indicus content uh, and hump height. And it's been, it's used genomic testing. We've done more recent research um, using genetic markers to understand that relationship between Bos indicus content and consumer eating quality. Now, part of that research uh, was to further examine the relationship between hump height and Bos indicus content and compare that combination of hump height, hot standard carcass weight and sex to genomic testing as a predictor of eating quality. And what was found was the accuracy of predicting eating quality using either um, hump height or genomic testing was similar. So due to this accuracy um, and commercial application of being able to measure hump height, uh, we're using this as the direct predictor of eating quality now. So we also, like all of our research um, that we carry out, we did consumer sensory testing and this also clearly showed that hump height has that direct relationship with eating quality. So now the mod um, will use hump height, hot standard carcass weight and sex in combination to predict eating quality for individual carcasses. So you'll recall that in our new MSA vendor deck, um, you need to tick yes or no as to whether the cattle contain tropical breed content. If you tick no um, or 0% tropical breed content on the MSA vendor declaration, the model, so the computer program that sits behind MSA and is carrying out those calculations, it will check the relationship or the algorithm of this hump height, hot standard carcass weight and sex combination of each animal. And it has these inbuilt tolerance levels. So if the model detects that the combined attributes are within its tolerance, then it will just continue to predict the eating an accurate eating quality for that animal. However, if it detects that the combined attributes fall outside of the model's tolerance, 
Uh, the model effectively, it switches over and regards that animal as being declared with tropical breed content, so a yes. So it's basically raising its own internal red flag. Um, to do, it's basically raising its own internal red flag that the TBC declaration is incorrect and the model will treat that animal as being TBC tick, yes. Now for this animal and all animals that are ticked, yes, uh, the model factors in again, um, hump height, hot stand carcass weight and sex to predict an accurate eating quality for that animal. So I'm a little bit of a visual person and I know that there are lots of other visual people out there. And with this slide, um, we just want to show how hump height and hot standard carcass weight in combination have an effect on eating quality. So it's also important to note at the moment that that hump or the rhomboidus muscle is just that, it's just, an, it's a muscle and as animals get heavier, it's also expected that this muscle too will get bigger across all types of animals. Um, it's just that this differs between, differs in proportion um, to the rest of the muscles if we can bear a Bos taurus and a Bos indicus type animal. So on the screen, you can see two um, Bos indicus type um, animals or animals that contain tropical breed content. And if we look at steer A, uh, we have a large hump with a lighter hot standard carcass weight. So its hump to weight ratio is large um, and the hump effect or in other words, the effect hump height has on eating qualities, it's exacerbated in this animal. So what's happening in the model is that the model regard, will regard steer A as having a more negative impact on eating quality and thus having that negative impact on, on the MSA index. Now, if we look across to steer B, we have the same hump, so uh, same hump height. And although this is still a large hump, the hump is actually smaller in proportion if we consider how big the other muscles across that carcass are. So its hump to weight ratio uh, comparatively to steer A is therefore smaller and the heavier hot standard carcass weight, so that um, carcass weight of 380, will counteract some of the hump effect there. It's really important to note um, though that within the model there's a point where when hump is large, regardless of the weight, it will max out that hump effect or the effect that it's having on the eating quality and further on, on your MSA index. So it doesn't matter um, sort of what that hot standard carcass weight is, the effect sort of hit its maximum. Um, and you'll see that if you are able to sort of jump onto the MSA calculator, so for a certain hot standard carcass weight, if for an input and keeping all attributes, all other attributes the same, um, once you hit a certain point of hump height, that index will not continue to change, it sort of just plateaus and you'll receive the same index. So having a look at um, more, a similar scenario, but with Bos taurus type animals um, or animals declared 0% tropical breed content on the MSA vendor declaration. We can see steer C here, the first steer on the left side. Um, and this is for visual purposes, but steer C is one of the, is an example of how the hump to weight ratio is large and the ratio falls out of the model's tolerance levels that we spoke about um, earlier for cattle declared as no tropical breed content. So basically 
the model's recognising that the proportion of the hump to the rest of the carcass is greater than what would it would normally recognise to be within a normal range for a 0% tropical breed content animal or a, a true Bostaurus type animal. So like I said, the model, it will switch over um, and regard this animal as TBC, yes, and it'll just continue to predict its eating quality. If we look over at steer D, uh, comparatively again, it has the same hump height, but it has a heavier carcass weight. So the size of that rhomboidus or hump muscle is within proportion to the other muscles um, in the carcass that the model recognises within its tolerance level. And again, comparatively to steer C, with all other things being equal, so the other attributes such as marbling, ossification, um, rib fat, the impact on eating quality will be more positive um, and the index in this animal uh, will be higher. So to summarise these last few points, we're now using hump height as a direct um, predictor to eating quality because the consumer sensory research, it clearly shows that it has that direct relationship with eating quality. Um, but with com within combination uh, with hot standard carcass weight and sex, it gives an accurate outcome or prediction uh, for, the, for the individual carcass. So jumping to the new look my MSA, um, like I said earlier, MSA, my MSA is getting a little bit of a, an upgrade and a facelift. So what you'll see um, on my MSA is currently uh, you have all of your options across the top. We're moving to an easier navigation, so a left-hand menu. Um, the uh, mobile, so the platform, it's becoming mobile responsive, so being able to use it on your phone, tablet or desktop computer. And a really um, great addition to um, the platform is also these help prompts on every page. So that little question mark icon, so you can get help that is specific to the page that you're on at that point in time. So just a quick look at what it's going to look like um, as well. So again, with that uh, left-hand menu navigation, uh, it'll include um, the features that you've come to see in the My MSA platform, such as benchmarking and customised reports, and just overall um, a clearer, uh, clearer look. So. When this, when will you see this new Look My MSA? And this will be when your processor has switched over to using the new MSA model. If you're sending to, mul if you're consigning cattle to multiple processors, um, you'll see the new My MSA um, when any of those um, processors first switch across. And this will be happening between June and September. Again, for anybody who isn't currently using my MSA, you're able to access uh, all of your consignment kill data and feedback sheets. We have a range of benchmarking um, features and tools. So tools like uh, the MS, being able to calculate your MSA index, being able to uh, look at your non-compliance and carcass attributes, and then also reports uh, for specific consignments, reports over time, uh, and also being able to create your own customised reports. Another feature of my MSA is that you can access your eDeck or order your um, MSA vendor deck hard copy books here. So all your favourite things still in the one place. Now, I spoke before about what we're adding to my MSA um, and this new feature in the Opportunity Index. So you'll see this on the bottom of your feedback reports and the opportunity index is the MSA index your animals 
that were non-compliant would have received. So reasons for non-compliance are pH above 5.71, um, a rib fat of less than three millimetres and inadequate fat coverage uh, across the carcass. On the new feedback sheets, you're going to be able to see that clearly. It will be highlighted um, where animals have fallen out on minimum specifications. And then to calculate that opportunity index, we use all of the grading data that is collected um, and use the minimum um, requirements. So for rib fat, um, it defaults to three millimetres for pH, it, it defaults to 5.70. Um, and just to be able to see how those animals would have performed if they were compliant. The other thing that uh, you can't currently see on the screen, but will be added into the feedback sheet is a legend at the bottom that um, is an ex that explains um, each of the acronyms uh, or the grading attributes across the top row. And again, that's uh, just looking at our opportunity index, like your MSA index will be to two decimal points. And like uh, my MSA, you'll be able to see this once your processor has switched over to using the new model. And again, between June and September. So how these changes are affecting cattle producers. Initially, there's nothing that producers will be required to do differently other than um, know that a new MSA vendor deck is coming. Um, and once you run out of your current forms, uh, moving across to using that, that vendor declaration that'll be available in September. The MSA model is changing. We're using hump height now as that direct predictor of eating quality rather than just verifying um, the tropical breed content that's declared. And my MSA is being modernised with some enhanced features. So next steps, um, just a little bit of a timeline, what's happening in the next few months and further communications. So like I've said, uh, processors, they're being switched across to using the new, using the updated model um, between June and September. And once this switch occurs, this is when you'll start to um, See that new look, my MSA, and your cattle being being graded within uh, with that new model. And again, September is when the vendor declaration becomes available to use. Over the next coming months, MSA is going to be in contact with all registered MSA cattle producers, um, explaining more information um, around the changes that we're making. So this recording will also be available to rewatch on the Future Beef website. And for those of you who are subscribed to Beef Central, um, we've published a few articles. A few articles have been published recently about the changes. So in um, sort of conclusion with the changes that we're, that we're making, again, MSA has always been based on, on solid foundations of strong science, consumer testing and all of our changes being endorsed by industry. Changes that are affecting cattle producers uh, this year and over the next couple of months, you'll be seeing a new vendor declaration. Um, you'll be seeing an updated uh, at my MSA online platform and also those model updates are taking effect. And next steps, uh, if you are an MSA producer, uh, you'll be receiving more communication from us as to the changes that we're making this year. And if there are any questions, we would be happy to answer those.